Welcome into the New Orleans Pelicans podcast presented by SeatGeek, a podcast dedicated to everything you need to know about the squad. Ingram the rebound, no look to CJ, left wing three, heat check Christian James McCollum. Three for three from three in the quarter for the certified bucket getter. Yeah, you're right. The New Orleans Pelicans podcast starts right now. Oh, welcome to the Pelicans podcast. I am Joe Cardosi, joined by the cocksure Jim Eichenhofer. We are the Pelicans podcast presented by SeatGeek, and I don't think we could be any more jazzed today. I don't know if it's the lack of sleep and the crazy delirium I'm feeling from just a whole week of it. I don't know if it's the big win. I don't know if it's just seeing your smiling face, Jim, but I'm feeling uh, dazzled today. I'm feeling dazzled as well. Yeah. I feel like I'm sure neither of us got a ton of sleep last night, but it no. doesn't even matter because we're here before 10 a.m. recording this. And I know I was still tweeting at 1.30 last night, so I don't know how Same. to add the math to like that of how much sleep I got. I went to bed finally but yeah, something. I'm fired up. I mean, that was a great win last night for a bunch of different reasons yes. to be able to finish the road trip 3-1. and one. I know there was definitely some concern going into it, and people might have said, you know, hey, can you at least go 2-2? Two and two? You know, yeah, maybe 1-3 th- and three might be tough because of the competition, but, man, they – picked a really good time to play some of their best basketball of the season. Yes, especially, you know, as deflating as that Golden State uh, loss was, especially because the Pelicans, it seemed like, had it in hand. Uh, I feel like this routing of the Denver Nuggets, shorthanded, quote-unquote, with no Jokic, uh, sort of takes a lot of that, uh, you know, the the muck off of that one. You know, I I feel Mm -hmm. much better about, uh, you know, sort of letting one slip away against one of the best teams at home in the NBA. I think it's easy. I don't want to say forget the Golden State game, but it's easy yeah. to move past it. It's yes, easy to, I feel to get bad. in your head of like, you know, that was tough the way that game went. But, I mean, you bounce back two days later and hold the Nuggets to 88 points. Yes, they didn't have Jokic, but the Pelicans are also missing a certain all-star that uh, – I think is also important. Exactly. To the, yes. It's like to people, squad, are, so. people are saying that, oh, the no, no yoga it makes a huge difference. Yeah. Doesn't it? Doesn't it? <laughs> uh, you know, we, we've yes. been getting no credit for Zion being out. People just so, sort of seem to forget that. But uh, yeah, it makes a huge difference in how a team operates. We saw that with Denver last night. And, uh, you know, another thing that we talked about uh, last night on the post game show, which went into the wee hours, uh, mm-hmm. was you know, what it means for the Pels, just just basically in terms of the momentum, the, the carryover from game to game, a big problem we had with the Pelicans' performances not that long ago was that they would have a great performance against one team and then just come out flat uh, or operate well in one area and then just not be able to carry it over game to game. Now, it seems like consistently, even with the Golden State loss, you're seeing the Pelicans assert themselves, play the game they want to play it, and they are having no problem scoring now. Yeah, I think two things. One, you just mentioned, I mean, for a long stretch from January through March, the Pelicans were one of the struggling offensive teams in the league, maybe top or bottom five, bottom eight offense during that long stretch. But lately, that part of the floor has been so much better. You're getting night in and night out. You're getting a ton of productivity. You're getting Brandon Ingram playing maybe the best basketball of his career. Yeah. He has two triple-doubles over the last seven days. Two Thursdays in a row, he came up with a triple-double. His second career triple-double. Right. And, uh, you know, it also, I got to say, uh, props to Kingram. His uh, 31 points, 11 rebounds, 10 assists. Uh, only two players in franchise history with multiple 30-point games, uh, 10 rebounds, 10 assist games. That's uh, B.I. and CP3. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. And so you pair what he's been doing to lead the offense with – the defense has been so uh, – to me, the defense is the foundation of why when you, you bring up consistency and why they've been able to not have dips from night to night mm-hmm. and be able to string together a bunch of wins. I know you know Jokic, but look at that score, 107-88 right. to the mm-hmm. number one seeded Denver Nuggets. And that's the third time in the last five games that the Pelicans have held the other team under 100 points. Yeah. As we know in today's NBA where everyone's shooting three-pointers like it's going out of style <laughs> yes. and everyone's putting up points easily. I mean, we're seeing 120 points maybe five years ago used to be like, whoa, that's a huge night, and now right. we see it happen all the time. Yawn. So if you hold Charlotte to 96, you hold Portland – 
Okay, maybe that's not as impressive with who they're fielding. But <laughs> yes, you yes. held them to 90 points. Still. You hold Denver to 88. And I thought that was the best defensive performance that the Pelicans have had in a long time. Now, Denver definitely missed a bunch of shots, and that was something that Willie Green talked about after the game was that they did have some open looks that they didn't make. But if you look at even with Jokic not on the court, if you look at some of the weapons that they have with Jamal Murray, Michael Porter Jr., some of their reserves are pretty dangerous. I mean, it was it was a huge plus to be able to hold them down the way the Pelicans did. Murray had 21, but Porter only had 10. Um, Aaron Gordon had 11 points, one of the other starters. Um, so it was – I think Christian Brown had some good moments off the bench for them. Yeah. And Bruce Brown had a pretty good game as well with 19 points. But other than that, I mean, it was just – it was great stuff that the Pelicans um, did defensively. They had – Nuggets had two quarters under 20 points. So, I mean, just awesome start to the game and awesome finish to the game defensively. And we should also mention that Herb is doing all this defensively with basically one eye. He was out there with a mouse under his eye from Eric Gordon, our pal, mm-hmm. uh, throwing an elbow at him and, uh, you know, still gutting through it and operating well. Uh, Also, big props to uh, our friend Trey Murphy. He has the most threes in a month in team history. His 58th there uh, made it in March. The most threes in team history. It seems like this team is just uh, putting themselves up in in, uh, hollowed company, man. Yeah, a lot of records lately. They they are just uh, operating great. Uh, Another thing I love to see was uh, Willie Green and Jonas, that TNT audio uh, where he was like, hey, man, you get one more pump fake. One more. <laughs> and if it works, maybe you get another one. Uh, it was nice to see Willie Green in a good mood, feeling loose, because I know that man has been feeling some pressure lately. Yeah, I mean, those two players that you mentioned, I mean, I talked about Ingram, his triple-double, the way that he's led the offense, the way that the offense has reached a different level. I mean, over the same period lately of a couple weeks, the fact that the Pelicans have gotten the ball to Jonas Valanciunas so consistently – and been able to lean on him to to take over stretches of games where he'll score eight points in a yes. few minutes and um, just kind of settle almost everything a double down. Double-double in the first quarter. Right. Like right yep. away. Yeah, he's been so good. And Trey Murphy, I mean, we t- talk about consistency. Every game since March 12th, he's made at least three pointers except for the game at Portland where he was one for seven. Uh, didn't need, need him to make a lot of threes that game because yeah, of the Trailblazer the bu- situation. The bus driver but, was their number one <laughs> yeah, scorer, yeah. you know, as you yes, mentioned. Yes, exactly. Yeah, they only needed one for seven from three point range from Trey to win that game by thirty four points. So we'll we'll give him a pass on that one. But sure. it's pretty impressive the fact that over the last ten games he's made at least three three pointers in every single night. So and even going back before that he had a stretch where he made three plus three pointers in almost every game. So I mean it's been since really the beginning of March. I mean you mentioned how he set the the franchise record for most three pointers made now that March is over. Yeah. I mean, the very start of March, he had three threes at Portland when Portland was not using the a bus driver in their <laughs> yeah, rotation. Back, back when they were still legitimate. Three yeah. threes at Golden State and four at Sacramento on that on, on that same road trip. So I mean he's been he's been so good. He's been one of the best three point shooters in the NBA over these last few weeks. Yeah. And it's evidenced by the fact that you know, this franchise has had some great, great three-point shooters, Pedro Stoyakovich for for one, and he still made more threes than anyone ever has in a month. Yeah, I mean, that that's uh, crazy to mention when you talk about uh, the three-point shooters we've had here. Uh, you know, Trey Murphy just absolutely shooting the cover off the ball. Mm-hmm. It shows you why he was so untouchable in some of those trade talks. Uh, you know, I do want to get to, uh, you know, what it means this game. You know, we it's a big win. Of course, it felt good uh, to beat the, the Denver Nuggets in their own house. Uh, especially when, you know, you looked at that schedule and then a lot of people were saying, man, we could lose all that, that whole stretch. Mm-hmm. And then you go three mm-hmm. and one. I think that feels pretty good, especially with the way you played most of that Warriors game. So, you know, big picture though, what does this mean for the Pels in terms of standings? We did jump up. We were sitting ninth uh, mm-hmm. as that game began, jumped up to seven. Uh, I know there's a lot of stuff still shaking out in the West, but this one helped us a lot. It really, I mean, this was immense. To be able to pick up this win was so huge as far as the position that they're in. Really, if they had lost that game, they would have been in ninth place going into Friday's games. And then you'd have the potential for some of the teams below them to make up some ground on the weekend. OKC, for example, plays at Indiana Friday. That that on yeah. paper, you would think they would get that win, even though they did just lose to Charlotte and barely beat Detroit. But nonetheless, going back to specifically what it means for New Orleans, I mean... For one thing, you know, we were talking about this in the pregame radio show last night, and I think Mr. Gus Cattengill made fun of me a little bit by saying that he, he was like, Jim's already given magic numbers. Let's and I was like, up. 
I was like, Gus, it's only five. Yes. So the magic number now is only four because of the win last night. So I did think that maybe going back a few days, it was a little too early to get into magic number. You don't want to say, hey, the magic number is 14, and people are like, 14? Come right. on. Yeah. That's ridiculous. But now that it's four, I think it is something that we can really look at. Yeah. So basically, if the Pelicans win four more games the rest of the season, they're in the playing tournament no matter what. But that number can also be reduced by – Utah and Dallas lo- losses as well. So the starting from that Dallas losses look more and more like, yes, they, they do just seem like they are crumbling. Right. And they play Miami and Atlanta, both on the road this weekend. So I'm sure we're going to get into maybe more of the schedule and the specifics and the scoreboard watching later. But um, from a Pelican standpoint, they are getting closer and closer to clinching the play in tournament berth, which to me is step one yes. of what we're looking at. But on the other end of the spectrum in terms of the standings, they're back within one game of Golden State. Now, who's in sixth place? I remember when, after the Lakers' loss in early March, a lot of people were looking around and acting like that clinched the Lakers were going to finish ahead of the Pelicans, and there was that was yeah. the end of the story, end of debate. Yeah, now, I heard forget a lot it. of that. Yeah. And, and after Tuesday's loss to Golden State, I think it was easy to, to be like, okay, this loss means the Pelicans can't catch Golden State. It's over, blah, right. blah, blah. Um, only the Pelicans, like I said, are only one game behind Golden State. Golden State is in that last spot where I feel you like can, we got a little something extra for them now to move and forward. Yeah, just saying. for sure. And the Pelicans have the tiebreaker as well, so they're going to need a little bit of help. But I do think that what Thursday's win over Denver did, going back to your point and your question, is it put them back into the conversation as far as you know. It's not they're not that far out of sixth place. Yeah. If they have a great homestand, they can. That's doable as well. So. Just across the board, I mean, it was it was a massive win. I know a lot of people looked at it on paper like you're playing Denver on the road. That's probably you chalk that up as a loss if you're trying to fill out your. I mean, when you look at those four games, you know, honestly, if if I expected to split it fifty fifty, if if I was going to say mm-hmm. that, I was looking at Golden State Denver. You know, as, right. as the two as games, the like, okay, yep. I, mm-hmm. I I would not be uh, shocked by those. Right. I hope we win them, but mm-hmm. that wouldn't, that wouldn't shock me. So you look at this homestand, we're going to get into there, all the reasons why it looks so juicy, especially now with wind in our sails, mm-hmm. you feel so much better about it. One of the reasons we feel a little better going forward is, uh, I tweeted it last night. A bunch of people tweeted about it. Zion was warming up in Denver pregame. We haven't seen that in a while. Now, yeah. we should say he was mostly doing sort of mid range, uh, jump shots and whatnot, mm-hmm. but at the end, he did have a dunk. Um, the, the big thing is, it's progress. And uh, we don't want to mm-hmm. overstate it and be like, he's coming back tomorrow. Like it's, right. you know, a wrestling sure. kind of thing. He's just going to run out from behind a curtain. <laughs> uh, but, you know, yes. Zion is getting closer. The fact that he's out there, that's huge for us. Yeah, TNT seems to be very optimistic that we're going to see him next week. So we'll see how that plays out. I mean, it's a it would be a massive boost for him to be able to get back on the court. Yes. You can plug him in and do the same thing that you're doing with Jonas Valanciunas lately, which is, hey, here's the ball. Go to work, and no one can stop you. And, I mean... Oh, and you've got another monster in the paint to deal with, right. too. Yeah. The plus that that could provide is hard to even measure. So, yeah, that would be incredible for him to be back in the lineup and on the court. Um, the good thing is, for now, in this next stretch of a couple games before... He could potentially return. I mean, the way that they're playing right now is so encouraging. You know, another thing I'll add, too, in terms of the signs going into this homestand, if things go the way that we hope and expect them to, where the Pelicans are in the postseason, they're at least in the playing tournament, hopefully they get a playoff berth, they've come up with some great road wins lately. Yes. And we know that in April they're going to have to pick up some wins on the road to go as far as they possibly can. So, to have the road trip that they had, they still have one road game left in the regular season at Minnesota. That could be a massive game in terms of. I think of, that if you look at the upcoming schedule, I mean, there's only five games left. There's five right. games left. Yeah. When you look at the schedule, that T Wolves game looks like it's the most likely to be just an absolute dog fight. Right. You and know, it, especially standings wise. Mm-hmm. And, you know. Exactly. So to be able to win at Denver the way that they did, they won at the Clippers. I think you have a lot more confidence about some of these road games coming up. I mean, obviously we know only know one for sure that's locked in, but we hope that there will be a bunch more after that. Yeah, absolutely. And and look, we did have a lot of fun, even though it was a late one uh, in the studio. Uh, Jim was in there with me. It was a lonely one in the Smoothie King Center because Gus, uh, Kat and Gail, and Aaron Summers, they were out having a fun time at the Wrong Iron Watch Party. But while it was fresh, Jim joined me, and we talked about the Denver win while we were still feeling ourselves a little bit. And uh, let's uh, listen in to a little bit of it.
Yeah, B.I.'s second career triple-double. His first career triple-double was uh, only a, f- a couple hundred feet from where we're sitting right yeah. now on the court out here last Thursday against Charlotte. So, I mean, tremendous. What a stretch that he's had over the last uh, bunch of games. Been one of the best players in the NBA, I would say. I mean, yeah, yes. Western Conference Player of the Week. And I feel like he's making a bit at trying to get that war- award again in the second week in a row. C.J., like you said, he had six three-pointers in the second half. He was very quiet in the first half, had two points, one yeah. for four for shooting. But then he just went off in the third quarter with four straight three-pointers. Rebound, no look to CJ, left wing three, heat check, Christian James McCollum. Three for three from three in the quarter for the certified bucket getter. Yes, Christian James McCollum. I mean, just in- tearing impressive. it I'm, up. I'm James Christian, by the way. I don't know wow. if that's a... That's just kind of an odd coincidence. If you stayed up late enough to know, now you know. (laughs) I have a similar three-point shooting ability as CJ, though. Yeah, you just don't like to show off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're humble. But, yeah, it was was a great second half by him. Um, You know, you mentioned how coming off the Golden State game the other night, I mean – you're back within a game of Golden State right now. Right. I was about to say, and I mean, I, I know this feels like a huge win just because of it's a it's a it's on TNT. Uh, it's a big, you know, on the road against. Look, even though they don't have the Joker, it's still the Denver Nuggets. It just had a weight to it. It really did. But it has mm-hmm. tangible consequences. Clippers are coming here Saturday night to the Smoothie King Center. So now be the, there. The Clippers are playing at Memphis tomorrow. So we're going to ask people to do something that we would normally not ask them to do, and that is root for the Grizzlies. You know, I kind of am just because of the Draymond stuff and Dylan Brooks. Just a a part of me. It feels dirty, but just, you know. Yeah, no. You don't feel dirty at all rooting for Dylan Brooks tomorrow night because that will be very beneficial. I think overall, if you want to take a step back and look at the big picture, the best news from tonight beyond the fact that they won a huge game was that you're coming back home for four games. And the way the Pelicans have played in the Smoothie King Center pretty much all season, they might have had one stretch in, say, January, early February, where they were losing games, and that was part of the the long losing streak overall that they had. But other than that, I felt really confident and good about almost every every game that they've played here all season, almost regardless of the opponent. There's been a couple teams where that have come in here, like I remember Boston in November, and you said, man, this team, maybe Boston's a little bit higher level than the Pelicans, but for the most part... They've been in every single game, and like I said, if you look at the record at home, you feel really good about their chances of winning. Especially with wind games. in their sails now. I mean, mm-hmm. they're coming in yeah. here hot. A lot of momentum. And and I mm-hmm. feel like I can't, I can't remember another time where they rolled in here with more momentum and, and with more consequential games on the slate than here. It, it's going to be huge, man. And, and I think the biggest thing when you talk about identity is they've been so much better defensively lately than they were in the previous stretch. It seemed like tonight was probably the best example over the last few weeks of you play defense like that and the other team isn't going to be able to put together any big runs. So you feel a lot more confident when you have a double-digit lead when the other team is never putting together even three or four good offensive possessions in a row. So I'd say that's probably the biggest thing that we would love to see carry over into these next four home games is if they can play defense like that. I mean, they had a stretch where the the Pelicans' offense was so poor that if the other team got to 110, 115 points, they were having a really hard time yeah. staying in games. But now they're keeping some of these opposing teams down to 100 or less or 105 points. And, I mean, they have a really good – the offense for the Pelicans has come up now. So Yeah, Trey's a lot of times, been looking good. Yeah, I mean, B.I.'s been looking good. Everyone's yep. just coming together when we need them the most. Right. So you add all those – you add those things together, and, I mean, that's why they're winning a lot more games. The defense has just been kind of the foundation, the rock mm-hmm. lately. Well, you know, we call you an oracle for a reason because you are correct uh, pretty much all the time, and we've <laughs> talked about it on the podcast uh, almost breathlessly. You do not want to see this Pelicans team healthy, and, man, uh, your prediction once again comes true. You know, <laughs> as other teams are getting worn down, their spirit's sort of breaking. It seems ours is lifting up, and Zion is looking all right. Man, I, I, I didn't believe you when you looked into your orb, but I should have, Jim. I'm sorry. It, it's very hard for me to keep a straight face and keep my concentration with this music playing. Yeah, usually I added it after. <laughs> but, but. Uh, but no, uh, no, you're right. I mean, things are really uh, looking up right now. And the best part about my predictions is that when I make one that's totally wrong, I just never bring it up again. And yeah, what prediction? People just forget about it. So yeah, yeah. Um, I had I had one that was a little off about 
um, in January what? when no I and way. Zion were both out in terms of how they how competitive they were yeah. going to be, but that's okay. That's all right. Nobody remembers that. No, uh, who, no I, I, I feel like I we're, we're so fired up right now. We, we should just record the podcast right now. Let's I mean, just do I, it. I, I kind of Let's am. do it at like 1 a.m. What yeah. the heck? I'm not going to lie. This is going to end up on the podcast tomorrow, but I wanted to talk about it while it was fresh. Jim, thanks for hanging out with this old dog in the lonely, lonely Smoothie King Center. It's a cold night in the bowels of this arena all by my lonesome, <laughs> and I could just hear you furiously hammering away, just typing. It kept me up <laughs> i appreciate well it. it was great to be here joe yeah it was a, it's a little it's very low attendance in the arena tonight compared yeah. to a home game i think two? attendance of two but you Might know what it was a it right? was a fun night to be able to pick up a win like that and it was i mean that was the kind of win that maybe hopefully we'll look back at in a week or so and say boy that was a a massive win to get them into a higher seat. Absolutely. I just wish there were more people to hug and dance with, but Jim and I will do it ourselves. That's fine. Oh, man, that was a fun one. I feel like a walking corpse today. I am just uh, completely zombified from this week. Uh, I am mumbling incoherently, but uh, we are ready now. We are into the final five, Jim. Uh, But before we get to our own five games, there's Mm -hmm. so many other games being played. As we said, the West is fluid because of a lot of things we can't control. The scoreboard is going to be being watched. No one's watching it with more of an eagle eye than our (laughs) own, Mr. Jim Eichenhoff. Yes, I have my my magnifying glass (laughs) out. I'm I'm totally um, examining everything and every detail and every fine... Point of he the walks around board. with a jeweler's eyepiece, yes. just examining people. It's crazy. You know, it's funny about Friday, and I mean, you make a good point as far as it's funny the way the schedule is this weekend, where the Pelicans play Saturday, but they're only one of two games across the entire league because of the Final Four taking place Saturday. Yeah. The NBA usually does it that way, but because of that, like the, almost the entire league is playing Friday, and the entire almost the entire league is playing on Sunday. The Pelicans are not playing on Sunday, so if you're a fan out there, both Friday and Sunday are going to be really fun when the Pelicans are off to be able to just see some of the outcomes yeah, relax, of the other games, watch some scores. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, for Friday, there are so many games that are relevant. I almost feel like I can make power rankings of the games <laughs> to watch. Right. And so number one on my Friday power rankings, People love power. Rankings. <laughs> they, they do. They really do. <laughs> yes. Um, the Lakers versus Timberwolves at seven o'clock. Unfortunately, the winner of that game is going to move at least temporarily ahead of the Pelicans in the standings. <sighs> Um, so the Pelicans will be eighth after the outcome of that game, but that's okay because the Pelicans can do something about that on Saturday when they play the Clippers. Yeah. So that's number one. I think that's definitely, I don't think I'd get too many arguments that that's the game that most right. people are, are going to be focused on. Oh, the on. comments would still be trash if it's a power ranking. <laughs> that's wonder, true. Yeah. That's true. There would be people that would b- dispute the heck oh, out of it. Actually. Um, I think second is Clippers Grizzlies at seven o'clock. Um, the Grizzlies Ooh, big. are two games ahead of the Pelicans. So the key there is, the Clippers lose that game, and you're you're now you're one and a half behind them. You play them head to head, have a mm-hmm. chance to pull within a half game of them. Clippers are fifth right now as we speak Friday morning in the West. So that's one of the teams that you have to target besides Golden State. As can we bump those guys out of the top six, move ourselves into the top six? Right. So that's key as well. Third, and I'll stop at three out of the six games. Sure. In in terms of my power rankings, because I don't want to get too much. <clears throat> of the haters coming out there and disputing my power rankings. But you but, always got haters. Yeah. Man. It's ridiculous. I think third, I will put um, Utah at Boston. No, actually, excuse me, Oklahoma City at Indiana. Yeah. Only because Oklahoma City is um, right kind of on the doorstep of the Pelicans. They're right. one game behind them. The good news is that one game is kind of two games because the Pelicans have the, the tiebreaker against the Thunder. Yeah, we do. So we, we wouldn't mind, actually, if the Thunder are part of a multi-team tie because that brings in the Pelicans' 3-1 and one record against them. Yeah. That's helpful. So, But, but yeah, that that's also a, a key game. And then just didn't make my power rankings, but other games that are happening tonight that are important. Yeah, the runner's up. Utah is at Boston at 630. Utah is 36-40. and 40. Uh, Pelicans are starting to create a little separation from them, and that's a very tough game, as people know, for them to have to play in TD Garden. Um, And then lastly, uh, Denver at Phoenix. Phoenix has a little bit of a gap on the Pelicans. It would take the Suns losing multiple games, I think, for them to become part of the equation. But nonetheless, that's another one. And then lastly, only because I feel like the Spurs have not been very competitive, um, San Antonio at Golden State, 9 o'clock. 
And that wraps up the scoreboard. It's a long list of Ooh. games. And so you can turn on your TV at six o'clock and then follow all the way through the until the Denver Phoenix game starts at 930 and ends at midnight. I don't know if people still want to stay up again for another night this <laughs> yeah, week, but be tired. if they're up, if they're, if they're up to the challenge, there's a lot of basketball and a lot of scores. And then Saturday uh, morning, I will be back on pelicans.com breaking it all down, have a preview yes. of the Clippers game. And, uh, this is going to be a great weekend, though. I'm I'm really looking forward to it. You know, the people are going to be uh, up on Saturday morning like it's Christmas morning waiting for your breakdown, <laughs> I know, because I know I do. Uh, yes. And, uh, man, you know, that that is a hell of a uh, of a scoreboard watch, uh, a gym scoreboard watch, a jaw board watch. Uh, mm. I'm so tired, Jim. Yeah, we're going to have to work on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, but, you know, it, you, you talked about it. That, that's so much happening. And then we have our own Final Five, which we have to dedicate mm-hmm. some time to because Certainly. that's – that's enough. Like, so our next four games, right, are going to be 7 p.m. home games. Oh, oh thank oh, you thank for that. You. Uh, yeah. So that's actually, actually breaking news. Oh, well, breaking it's actually news, yeah. it's actually not really breaking news. It's been the case all season. But Saturday's games at 7:30. Oh, so so. so but you know, if you hour, if you show up a half hour earlier, that's fine too. Yeah, you know, if yeah. you want to. If you want to get know, a little man. extra prep time in, that's cool. But Saturday's yeah. at seven thirty. The other ones are at seven. Saturday that's true. So you know, still four games at home. I'll take it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you are facing. First of all, you're going to be facing the Clippers. No Paul George. Possibly no Kawhi. Yes, and in fact, you know, I just looked at the injury report that the Clippers put in for the game against Memphis that they're playing tonight, and he's Kawhi's listed as questionable for personal reasons. Now, the reason I checked the injury report was because I wanted to see maybe if he was available. And it's not necessarily neg- a negative he plays tonight in terms of Saturday because he has not played in back-to-backs. Mm. So I don't know. We're going to have to see how that plays out as far as whether he actually does play against Memphis and whether the issue that has him not necessarily available against the Grizzlies also keeps him out of the game Saturday. We'll have to wait and see. Right. But, I mean, it's possible that he doesn't play Saturday one way or the other. We'll have to find that out. But, yep. yeah, it's a huge game against the Clippers. I mentioned it during my interminable scoreboard <laughs> yes. watch of why that game matters and why you know how significant it could be especially yeah. if the clippers lose to the grizzlies on friday yeah so that's a that's a huge one i mean you could argue that I think it's a strong argument that that's the most important game of the four on the homestand. Well, there's so many things because the Grizzlies basically are, have their, their seating locked up, right. you know, and then so the Clippers are facing that uh, situation in terms of their health. Mm-hmm. And then the Clippers are going to be facing us on a back-to-back. Right. Uh, also, when we face the Grizzlies, they're going to be uh, coming off a back-to-back. So that helps us a little mm-hmm. bit, you would hope, uh, plus their playoff seating. Uh, being sure. uh, locked in, yeah. but first, before we face those uh, those Grizzlies, we face the Kings again. Their playoff spot is locked in. Right, it seems it's, like they wouldn't have that much to play for. It's a, it's a very interesting thing that they play. The Pelicans play Sacramento and Memphis Tuesday, Wednesday back to back at home because, as you mentioned, it's possible that both of those teams will be almost officially mathematically yeah. like this is our seeding, yes. and even if it's not. I don't know if they're necessarily going to – they're definitely not going to look at it as like a make-or-break, do-or-die game. I don't know if we're going to start to see some resting from some of those guys, but it is funny. You know, people have talked a lot about how the Pelicans have a very brutal schedule remaining, but there are extenuating circumstances in context context that 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 you need to know. Yes, that was based on like opponent winning percentage, et cetera, but Mm -hmm. the the other sort of underlying non-statistical things that are going on make it much more interesting and much more uh, feasible to to go on a big winning streak in this Final Five. And as we sit here Friday morning, and this is – this could change, but I mean, Memphis is two games ahead of Sacramento for that two, second and third spot. So, I mean, especially if the Grizzlies are able to increase that gap a little bit, and then both teams are like, okay, we know for sure as Memphis that we're going to be the two seed. We know for sure as Sacramento, we're going to be the three seed. Right. By the time we get to Tuesday and Wednesday, like we said, I think the motivation will decrease from their standpoint, which could potentially be helpful. Yeah. We, know, we know both of those teams are capable of so, Kings beat the Pelicans without De'Aaron Fox in the game that was yep. in Sacramento. Yep. Memphis has won a ton of games the last couple of years when John Morant was out for various reasons. Yeah. So um, it's not like those are by any means. Am I sitting here saying like, Oh yeah, no, they just well, walk no, on the court and win. Yeah. But, um, but, but yeah. none of this, these road stretch uh, wins were either. I mean, right. I, you looked at this road stretch like, ugh. and mm-hmm. I think a lot of the reason that, that you look at this stretch, especially with the circumstances we're, we're naming uh, as juicy matchups now is because you dominated 
uh, the Denver Nuggets without mm-hmm. Jokic. You you played very well. Uh, right. Basically, this whole stretch, you mm-hmm. are seeing a consistent team. So now when you see these extenuating circumstances with all these teams coming to our house, none of it looks as scary anymore. And the Pelicans are 24 and 13 at home. And if they play even 80% of what they've been playing lately, you combine that with being on your home floor. Yep. And I think the crowds are going to be very pumped up for some of these games. We're talking about opponents that people um, don't have a lot of love for in terms yes. of the Clippers and, and every Grizzlies game means especially. something. The blender is going to be crazy. Yeah. So I think you add all that stuff together and uh, you know, hopefully they can win three or four of these games. And if they are able to do that, you're talking a big jump in the standings. Yes, absolutely. Cause you, you face the Kings, the Grizzlies, uh, like you said, both playoff spots sort of locked in mm-hmm. at that point. You don't know how they're going to play. Then you face the New York Knicks with, as we just found out, no Julius Randall. Right. Uh, so that's going to make a big difference for that Knicks team. And another team, too, that, I mean, there's a very good chance. I'm going to go out on a limb here and make a Jim prediction. Jim Dritch. Jim, Jim, I'm so tired. Um, <laughs> that by Friday night, the Knicks are going to be the five seed in the East. Yeah. So, I mean, they're only going to have two games. The Pelicans also only have two games left in their season by then. I mean, they're definitely in a position where they're going to be, they probably are going to even have their playoff opponent seated in by then. So. Right. I think that's definitely going to be. Point. We won't see the, probably what we what the Knicks have been putting on the floor throughout the course yeah. of the season. And then you wrap it up with what we we sort of predicted earlier is going to be the dog fight game mm-hmm. because based on seating, based on talent, uh, you know you face the Timberwolves. So that's going to be how you round it out. Now the Timberwolves just lost Nas Reed, who he's uh, been playing so own, well. He's been he's been having a, mm-hmm. the, I guess the best season of his career so far. Looked like. Yep. And uh, also Todd Graffinini has called him. Pelican killer. <laughs> so uh, the Timberwolves are going to be without him. We're going to see how much of a difference that makes moving forward. But uh, again, another extenuating circumstance where you can look at this final five and go, there's there's a chance the Pelicans could take that one too. Yeah, yeah Reed has been, we know he's an LSU guy. Reed's been an everyone killer lately in yeah. addition to a Pelican killer. I mean, he's been playing so well. It was cool to see a guy that was you know not a high draft pick emerge the way that he has been yeah. lately. So it's unfortunate to see the injury happened, and I mean, yeah. it's just been kind of devastating to the West overall. Just, I mean, the Pelicans know the, the effect that injuries have had Absolutely this season on the race. But like you said, I mean, that has the. I'm so interested to see how this week unfolds coming up to see what the repercussions and implications of that Sunday afternoon game at 2:30 are mm-hmm. at Minnesota because it's just like there's so many possibilities. It could be the game that both teams. One of them gets the top six, the other one doesn't, and has to go right. to play in. It could be massive, re, you know, implications as far as you know. In, implications in the <laughs> yes in the play in tournament. Um, you hope at this point that it's not going to be you know the team one of the teams that loses this game could be out of the play in tournament overall. Right. Although I guess I wouldn't be sad if if we said you know if Minnesota loses this game yeah. they're not in the play in tournament. Yeah, but, boo-hoo. but nonetheless, um, the way things are shaping up, it's definitely going to be in some form, a game that everybody around the league is going to want to tune into. Yeah. Now, it's interesting. Every team in the Western Conference, except for one, is playing at 2.30 on that Sunday. So um, you're, you're going to have to pick which one. If you're an NBA fan, you're going to have to pick which one right. that you want to watch. You're not going to be able to watch all of them. Yeah. But I think there's a good chance that a lot of people are going to say this Pelicans-Timberwolves game is at the top of my list. On, it's number one on my power rankings of as course. far as which game to watch. Uh, man, it is going to be a mad dash down the stretch. You know, we've we've had so many seasons uh, where at this point we were sort of like, oh gosh, when is it going to end? Because yeah. we were out of it. Mm-hmm. And I think you know, just a, a short time ago, I don't know that our confidence levels were anywhere near what they are now. And and I don't know that rounding into the stretch, we could be at a better place right. because as low as we were not that long ago, I don't know that we could have predicted we'd be feeling this good at this point. Yeah, no, Joe, you're so right. In the past, I mean, there was so many times where I felt like at this point of the season that we were kind of the the kid that was not invited to the party. Yeah. Everyone else is having fun. Everyone else is end, breaking yeah. down the, the different possibilities of playoffs. And we were just kind of, you know, we only have a few games left and then it's over. Yep. But now, I mean, I live for this. I live for the position that the Pelicans are in right now. Um, it's just so much fun every day to look at the other games and look at the standings. And um, we're overdue for this kind of happiness yeah, we and are. This, this kind of fun at the end of a season. So Nice to see a bullion gym yeah, you know, at the it, end of a season. It's funny, too, because I always said, too, 
for a long stretch in the previous, you know, however many years, it wasn't just that the Pelicans made the playoffs only a couple times, but it was in the seasons that they didn't make it. They were really weren't often or ever like in the hunt going into the last week of the season. So this is so much better. And yes. I'm absolutely just enjoying this. It's, at it's this a moment. different Pelicans team watching the Pelicans get national respect. Like, you mm-hmm. know, so many people used to openly joke about, oh, the Pelicans are a team. What? The Pelicans? Yeah. And yeah. now you see people having to take us into account. And mm-hmm. that, to have that uh, as our identity going forward, it's something you could be proud of. And I think it's, well, no matter what happens, I feel proud of this Pelicans team right now. And I'm so happy that we are going into this final five with our heads up high, as tired as we are, and we can really make some hay. Jimothy, man, thanks for being my rock. You know, you kept me awake last night, ever smacking me, spraying me the water bottle when I was falling asleep, and yes. uh, man, you, you powered me through today. Appreciate you, man. I tried th- I tried to do the best I could. Um, I think it's a lot easier to keep grinding at 1 a.m., 1.30, yes. when the winds are coming the way that they have been lately. So yeah. let's just keep that going. Let's yes. have a lot of post-game fun, but let's have it at 10 p.m., 10.30, not 1 a.m., <laughs> yes. yes. 2, 2 a.m. Hashtag keep grinding, but reasonably. Uh, <laughs> thank you for listening to the Pelicans podcast. Thanks for staying up if you listen to the radio broadcast. Those were local exclusives as they were on TNT. Uh, so thank you if you checked them out and stayed up with us. Uh, We will talk to you once again on Monday. We are sponsored by SeatGeek. We are on Spotify, iTunes, everywhere you get your podcasts. Until Monday. Uh, Go Bills! (laughs) Thanks for listening to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast presented by SeatGeek. Join us three times per week on Pelicans.com, the Pelicans mobile app, or you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. We'll see you next time right here on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast presented by SeatGeek. Dyson for three. Thank you!